talked about our political leaders. He talked about all of it in the context of the two conventions about to get underway. Talked about the tenor and temperature, my words, not his, of the current conversation. Uh, and perhaps lowering that, keeping controls on that. Uh, we have just seen what uh, Donald Trump tweeted uh, after the president was finished. President Obama uh, just held a news conference, but he doesn't have a clue. Our country is a divided crime scene, and it will only get worse from Donald Trump. After the uh, tragic night in Dallas, and doesn't it just seem as if it's been a steady tempo of kind of crisis events that we have been covering and focusing our attention on. We were joined by Philip Atiba Goff, co-founder and president of the Center for Policing Equity, and uh, Professor John Jay College, visiting scholar at the Kennedy School up at Harvard. Um, Philip, you just listened to General Honore. I didn't want to embarrass him, but I think about him all the time in context of the now famous scene of him going through New Orleans and reservists had come into town post Katrina. They didn't mean any harm. They are our fellow citizens, but their, their rifle muzzles were up and he had to go through and remind everybody, put those guns down, you're exhibiting the wrong stance. Now, We've lived long enough to see that in, in other places where police felt they were under direct threat in Ferguson, Missouri, and so on. I don't know where to put the relationship right now between police and citizens, except to say this is another awful day for police officers in this country. I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, I was just literally yesterday, given what this past week was and the week before, praying we got through the weekend without having to have another story like this, and then getting phone calls from, um, you know, my brothers and sisters in law enforcement, the people I work with um, who are community activists. I have to say that these are two communities right now that both feel like they're under siege. Um, you have people who are feeling as if, you know, our communities are being occupied. You have law enforcement who feel as if they're being targeted. Um, and this is a time when law enforcement and vulnerable communities need each other like never before. Most of the day's coverage has been, and understandably so, trying to figure out what do we know about what caused this? What do we know about the shooter? And the answer for quite some time will continue to be not nearly enough. But what we do know is that there are people, there are families who are without their loved ones tonight. There are communities that are hurting, and there are parents who have to explain to their kids why the news always looks like this for the last two weeks straight. I've got godchildren, and they're getting not just exhausted, they're getting used to this. And that's exactly the time when communities that are most vulnerable not only need to be reaching out to law enforcement, but law enforcement needs to be reaching out to there, because the harm here is not just the bodies that are being mourned and the lives that have lost. The harm is the communities where peace has been fractured and where peace of mind and, and a, a life devoid of trauma seems like it's further out of reach every day. And pardon me, but it doesn't seem like we're on the precipice of, of improving our dialogue as we're about to begin not one, but two back-to-back -back political conventions. Well, unfortunately, given what the tenor of the rhetoric has been so far, I hate to say that it sounds right, but this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for both conventions to say, leadership is not the skill with which we can divide each other. Leadership is the skill with which we bring people who disagree closer together because that's when we're stronger and that's when we need each other the most. So I'm hoping that in media, on social media, in kitchen conversations, at block parties, as we huddle together to grieve together, that we also contemplate a little bit what leadership looks like. We understand it in families. A family that's strong with good leadership, with strong parents, is not one where we pit brothers against sisters and you know husbands against husbands or husbands against wives, wives against wives. That's not strong leadership. So my hope is that both conventions can take this as an opportunity to, to show what leadership can look like so that the communities that most need each other, again, have the opportunity to see each other's humanity. I have to say I'm touched by the fact that you see so many people really torn up and hurt at these fallen officers. And I think that's a, that's a great opportunity, as awful as it is, for the country to come together and say, every loss of life should be like this. 
we should be mourning like this and not casually dismissing and not using it as an opportunity for politics. And Philip, how about this separation between citizens? Let's take what General Honoré just said. Baton Rouge, Louisiana, before overtime, uh, if you're not among the millions of police moonlighting, uh, $31,000 is the starting salary. You begin life as a uh, fellow citizen and neighbor of the people you're protecting. Uh, in a perfect world, you remain viewed as that uh, neighbor who happens to carry a gun, keep everybody safe, but then something happens and we have these divided communities in America where one no longer feels a part of the other. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a complicated question, and I wish there was an easy answer. I know that there's been folks who have been, both from a law enforcement side and a community side, asking for residency requirements for law enforcement to live mm -hmm. in these communities, and we're seeing how some of that is really difficult. But there are, there are resonances of commonality. You heard General Honore saying that um, the open carry laws, which, by the way, open carry with zero uh, permit required in 31 states, he called that stupid. I have to say, that is the, one of the biggest complaints that I hear from law enforcement across the country when we work with chiefs and sheriffs, is that the gun laws, as we've set them up, are not common sense. They don't protect, protect the Second Amendment. They endanger law enforcement, and they endanger communities. By the way, it's people in vulnerable communities and law enforcement saying the same thing on that. So I think in, in many ways, the vulnerability of law enforcement, it goes hand in hand with the vulnerability of black communities. As much as we're harping on the divides, there's a lot of commonality here. And what will keep one group safe will keep the other group safe as well. And here's the last thing I want to say on just that point. When the world feels fair, that is when people comply with the law. When law enforcement feel like they're being treated fair, that's when they feel like, I feel excited to be coming to work. So this idea of justice is not just for one segment of America. It's the founding principle of America. All sides need it, and all sides are both safer and happier. They're healthier. We're healthier when we realize it. Philip Atiba Goff, Goff, thank you very much. Again, uh, it is only uh, some terrible tragedy that unites us on television. Uh, perhaps someday we'll just have a conversation. Uh, appreciate your time. Thanks for sharing your expertise and opinions with us. Another break for our coverage. We'll be back right after this.